Can you folks in the back hear me okay? Excellent. Um, let's just take care of a little bit of kind of course housekeeping uh, before we get into talking about something interesting like biochemistry. Just a reminder that AJ and Eli have agreed to give a review session again. This one will be on Monday at 6 to 7, and it'll be in this room. Uh, so that's a plus. And I, I think they'll have a handout again the way they did in the past. Any other questions about the review session um, before we move on? Okay, so review session. Um, there's a small tweak to the exam procedures compared to what we did the first time. This time, please bring your ID. We'll still be asking you at the door to show us ID so you know we know you're at the right room. We'll still be asking you to show us your ID number so we can check your exam on the way out. Um, but there's a little difference about which room. So if your last name is A through MI here, um, and if your last name is uh, M0, or not M0, MO through Z, that would be in odd one, uh, which should be actually uh, Beisner, excuse me, Beisner, Beisner, okay? Um, so a little bit, of, just a little slice of people are going there that might have gone here and so on. Um, and I will uh, try to send this around as well. Um, again, if you can't arrive by 3.30, we'll ask you to wait till 3.40 so we can admit just one little cohort of people coming in. Even with the two rooms, please try to move into the centers and, and all that kind of good stuff. Um, so, any other questions about procedures um, or anything like that? Okay. <clears throat> so, we'll put that away. So, do people have any questions about um, carbohydrate metabolism and the various things we talked about in Chapter uh, 10? Any questions about those before we move on to the citric acid cycle? Okay. So far, the, the metabolic pathways we've talked about in detail have been focused on just ones that involve, in some sense, carbohydrates. And um, uh, now we're going to enter kind of the, the heart of the metabolic pathway. The, pa the, metab the, the cycle we're going to talk about now is a convergence point for all kinds of things. So the, the citric acid cycle is, is considered an amphibolic pathway rather than just catabolic or just anabolic. Um, glycolysis is catabolic, it breaks down sugar. Gluconeogenesis is anabolic, it builds up sugar. Uh, pentose phosphate pathway is principally uh, uh, anabolic because it's producing things for synthesis and so on. Uh, but the citric acid cycle, there's no way to draw a line between. It's both at once, and you're going to see why. It is catabolic in that it is the principal way in which the cell uses, uh, the principal pathway the cell uses to oxidize carbon atoms to carbon dioxide. So when you breathe out, that carbon dioxide was mostly produced in the citric acid cycle. As it oxidizes those carbons, it's going to transfer that chemical potential, that metabolic energy, into something that will be used to make ATP. There's a little smidge of nucleotide triphosphate made in citric acid cycle itself, but mostly we're going to make something that will in turn make ATP. The citric acid cycle can burn anything. You can burn sugar in it. We've just finished glycolysis. We'll show you where pyruvate gets into it. But you can burn fat in it. You can burn amino acids in it. So if you're getting um, a diet that is uh, rich in protein and fat and not so much carbohydrate, some of, the, some of the protein might end up being burnt through the citric acid cycle to give you energy and stuff. It is also an anabolic pathway because this is one of the key places in which cells take out building blocks that can lead to amino acids, and there's several places in the cycle that do that. Um, the citric acid cycle is one of the places that provides the carbon backbones that are needed for gluconeogenesis. When we introduce gluconeogenesis, we talk about starting from pyruvate. But obviously, if you're making new sugar, you don't start from pyruvate from glucose. <laughs> you had to get that pyruvate from something else. And the citric acid cycle is one way of, of getting into those things. Uh, the citric acid cycle also provides heme precursors. So it's a very, very versatile and key pathway. It really repays attention. Uh, there are num it's a cyclic pathway, so in principle, we could start talking about it almost anywhere, but since we've just finished glycolysis, we're going to probably start talking at it at a place that we have easy access from, uh, from glycolysis. Am I 
Is this a good volume or am I too loud or too soft? Okay, okay. I don't know why I'm feeling paranoid today, but okay. So this is the, the high-level overview type map of what's going on with the citric acid cycle. We talked uh, most recently about uh, glucose polymers being made into glucose itself and the pathways that can break it down to the th two and three carbon intermediates. So pyruvate would be a three carbon intermediate produced from glycolysis. But it could have come from any of these other poly uh, polymers uh, to produce the three carbon intermediates for the citric acid cycle. Um, in the citric acid cycle, uh, a lot of NAD plus and some uh, ubiquinone will be reduced to NADH and QH2. These reduced forms are going to then be used for oxidative phosphorylation, and this is where most of the ATP will come from the things that we're uh, using as fuels. Um, so this is sort of here at the center of things. Now, if we're starting from, from uh, glycolysis and to some extent from other sources as well, uh, the fuel we're going to feed into the citric acid cycle is likely to come from pyruvate dehydrogenase. So we finished glycolysis, we've got this three carbon pyruvate, and we'd like to throw it into the citric acid cycle. But the citric acid cycle doesn't burn pyruvate directly, it has to be converted into acetyl CoA. Acetyl CoA is a high energy compound. Um, and it's an activated form of the two-carbon fragment, so we can do other things with it. And the enzyme that allows this to happen is this very pretty colored uh, beach ball here called pyruvate dehydrogenase. And pyruvate dehydrogenase is almost like a, a little factory. It's a complex that's got three different enzymes in multiple different copies, all of them arranged together to make this little uh, power plant, if you like, <clears throat> this pre-plant, pre-power plant, that's going to process the uh, pyruvate. <clears throat> and depending on the species, that uh, pyruvate dehydrogenase complex can have anywhere from 60 to 140 pep proteins in it. You can see it's a fair-sized object. This thing is over 200 angstroms top to bottom, so 20 nanometers uh, 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 across, uh, quite a good-sized chunk. And the overall reaction uh, we're going to see is pyruvate uh, plus CoA plus uh, NAD plus is going to give rise to an acetyl CoA, the activated two carbon fragment, and a carbon dioxide molecule and reduced NADH. Uh, so the reduced NADH can be fed on down into oxidative phosphorylation, and the acetyl CoA is going to get fed into the citric acid cycle. Carbon dioxide we breathe out as we go. Uh, to accomplish something like this, it turns out to be surprisingly difficult, and the enzyme is really quite quite com complicated. Uh, the first enzyme in the series uh, can, can itself be called pyruvate dehydrogenase, if you like, because it, it is the one that actually does that to pyruvate. It's also sometimes called pyruvate decarboxylase to reduce confusion. <clears throat> and what that enzyme is going to be able to do is um, uh, take advantage of thiamine pyrophosphate. Uh, so thiamine is one of the B vitamins that acts as a cofactor and uh, is present in a number of different enzymes. And that prosthetic group is going to uh, serve as a way to uh, catalyze the re removal of the carbon dioxide and making this covalently attached uh, two carbon fragment uh, uh, that's bound to the enzyme. So this, at this stage, the two carbons are bound to the enzyme. We've lost the carbon dioxide, but the, uh, the thiamine pyrophosphate holds on to the two carbons in a way that allows the next reactions to go forward. So the next step in the series is going to take, care, take advantage of a different cofactor, uh, lipoamide. Uh, li this is the business end over here of lipoic acid. It's a uh, di uh, sulfide, disulfide group in, in one of its two forms. And so the, the thiamine uh, pyrophosphate can transfer that two carbon fragment to the active site or the, the business end of the lipoamide. Um, and that allows you to, to regenerate the thiamine, so the thiamine is ready to do this for another incoming pyruvate. Um, and the lipoamide now has this um, uh, carbonyl carbon directly attached to the sulfur. And this again, if, if this looks a little bit reminiscent of what we saw on CoA when we covered chapter nine, the cofactors, you were right to guess that this is a fairly energetic uh, form of it all. 
So the second step will regenerate E1 to be ready for the next step, but E2 is still occupied by the two carbon fragment. Um, the other thing that's happening here is this carbon is getting uh, oxidized. So if you look over here, here's the carbon with an alcohol flying off into space, and here it is as a carbonyl carbon. So we're, we've oxidized this carbon. We probably are going to reduce something very shortly, and that's what's going to happen. Um, the E2 can transfer the acetyl group to a free-floating CoA group. So coenzyme A is water-soluble. It floats in. The uh, lipoamide in, of the E2 transfers the acetyl group to the CoA, and then it floats away. Um, but that leaves us now with lipoamide in this state. This is the reduced form of lipoamide. And in this form, first of all, it can't do anything else, and second of all, it's stuck away in the middle of pyruvate dehydrogenase. So the last step of all this is to try to, to restore the lipoamide and reduce something more useful. And the third step is going to take advantage of a different uh, reducing factor, FAD. Um, so enzyme 3 has FAD bound to it, and uh, the electrons from lipoamide are transferred to FADH2. And the FADH2 can then transfer them to NAD plus to release NADH and, and a proton. So um, this takes the electrons from the lipoamide, which is bound to the, the enzyme complex, to NADH, which is a freely diffusible form. So this is an enzymatic reaction or series of reactions that takes multiple cofactors. Some of them are bound to the enzyme. Some of them are free to diffuse. Uh, it's a really very intricate trick. Uh, to pull biochemically. I'll just introduce you to FAD a little bit more. FAD we're going to see again uh, in other parts of, this, of the pathway and when we get to oxidative phosphorylation. Um, the business end of uh, FAD stands for flavin adenine dinucleotide, and flavin, here's the riboflavin part of it, and that's why riboflavin is important in your diet. So you're hearing, I think, the names of a number of B vitamins that you've always thought you ought to have but never knew why. Um, the rest of it is, again, an adenine nucleotide. So here's an adenosine and the ribose and a 2-phosphate. So there are several of these uh, cofactors that have an adenine uh, nucleotide as part of them. Sort of an odd thing. And some people make some interesting speculations out of that. But the business end is over there. Um, and this is an overview for you to see how all these different reactions fit together. So you, this, this big complex is there because you have to make so many things happen in the right sequence. Um, and because they're all together as a big complex, it's extremely efficient. So you've got the incoming pyruvate, carbon dioxide comes off, uh, you've got the, uh, the hydroxyethyl group on the thiamine, which is going to pass it off to the lipoamide. Uh, lipoamide uh, passes the, the acetyl group off to the CoA and, and in the process is reduced. Those electrons get transferred to FAD and off or on off to NADH, so to, to make an NADH. So a very intricate uh, multi-factor uh, series of reactions. And this is showing you how such a complex is built up. You've got the three trimers of it, uh, of the lipoamide reductase, and six dimers of the uh, dihydrolipoyl dehydrogenase, which regenerates that E2, and then you've got 12 dimers of the pyruvate decarboxylase, the E1 in the series. Uh, so you can end up with a beautifully organized complex to let all of these things go forward, and the factors are all regenerated. So now the... Um, uh, the, the, the pyruvate that we made, uh, that, that we started thinking about through glycolysis, uh, is now an acetyl-CoA. And in the form of acetyl-CoA, we can feed those carbons into the citric acid cycle. Uh, we can use the citric acid cycle to burn, to oxidize the rest of those carbons. Um, and I want to give you an overview of the whole pathway so you get a general sense of it, and then we're going to look at the reactions in more detail individually. So here is the acetyl-CoA we just made out of using pyruvate dehydrogenase, two carbons there. And it's going to be smooshed together with uh, another molecule called oxaloacetate, which is a four-carbon compound, has a 
alpha keto carbon here. It's got carboxylic acids at both ends. Um, and because the acetyl-CoA is a high energy compound, that provides energy to drive this reaction forward, okay? Um, so a free CoA molecule is released. The two carbons and the four carbons together are smooshed together, and now we have a citrate. And citrate's a very pretty molecule. It's a tricarboxylic acid, which is one of the old names for the cycle, because I've got carboxylic acid at both ends and one in the middle. And it has an alcohol hanging off the backside. So it's a, a six-carbon tricarboxylic molecule that's uh, symmetrical. The next step is a little rearrangement. We're going to move the alcohol group just down one carbon to make it isocitrate. Iso something or others usually are just little rearranged things. Um, and then the next step, we're going to make more NADH. You remember we made some NADH through pyruvate dehydrogenase we, when we burnt off the first carbon. Here we're making another NADH, and not too surprisingly, here comes a carbon dioxide. So in going from the six carbons of the isocitrate to this five carbon compound, we can make an NADH by losing a carbon dioxide. And the molecule we've made that way is called alpha-ketoglutarate. And that sounds a little weird, but if you look through it, you'll see that the name helps. So here's alpha-keto. This is the alpha-keto here. Um, and it's glutarate because it's a little bit like glutamate, except that it's got the keto group there instead of the amino acid. So the glutarate is related to glutamate, and we'll see that later on. But for the moment, there's no nitrogen in this. Um, so this five-carbon compound is um, uh, potentially set up to, to react again, and uh, the next reaction that's going to be catalyzed will produce another molecule of NADH. It's driven again by the loss of a carbon dioxide. But the product in this case is a succinyl-CoA. Now, remember in Chapter 9, we talked about how CoA could carry a lot of different kinds of acyl groups. And so in this case, it's carrying a four-carbon uh, acyl group uh, with, again, the alpha-keto carbon. Uh, but it is a high-energy bond there, and so uh, the next enzyme can catalyze the production of a GTP when it releases the CoA compound. Kind of a slick trick. Um, this gives us the four-carbon succinate. Succinate's symmetrical, just two carboxylic acids, and it's saturated in the middle. Um, and the next three steps uh, um, are worth paying attention to. I, I guess... Yeah, the next three steps are kind of important to pay a little bit of attention to because we're going to see things very like it uh, in fatty acid oxidation, fatty acid synthesis, and a number of other places as well. So pay attention here at the middle two carbons. They're completely saturated with hydrogen at the moment. A dehydrogenase is going to remove hydrogen huh? um, and transfer it to ubiquinone. So this is another uh, oxidation reduction step. This is going to produce some energy, not quite as much energy. Uh, that gives us fumarate, and fumarate has a double bond in the middle. Uh, the en next enzyme is going to add a water molecule across that, so now we have uh, an alcohol sticking off there. So this is a partially oxidized carbon, um, and it again can be uh, further attacked uh, to produce another NADH, and now this is a more oxidized carbon. So this is now an alpha-keto uh, carbon. So that carbon has gotten oxidized from two hydrogens on it to two bonds to an oxygen, and in the process produced reduced cofactors like NADH and QH2 that we can make some energy out of. So that's the overview. It's, it's oxidizing carbons, and as it oxidizes the carbons, it's producing reduced cofactors that later on can be used to produce energy. Um, it can also be used to provide intermediates. So we're going to see that many of these uh, citric acid cycle intermediates are precursors to other things, and that, that's its, its anabolic. Uh, mode or its anabolic state of being. So let's take a little look at citrate synthetase. Here's citrate synthetase, the two carbons of acetyl-CoA, the four carbons of oxyl acetate with a alpha-keto uh, carbon there. And because this is the, has the high energy, this is the thioester bond, that's the energy sufficient to drive it to synthesize the six-carbon fragment. And you can see that like hexokinase, Citrate synthase kind of smooshes down on the substrates and completely clamps down on them. Um, it's a very large change in conformation when oxyl acetate binds. This is an irreversible reaction. Uh, just like many, many reactions that are driven by ATP hydrolysis, this is essentially an irreversible reaction. That's why it has a one-way arrow. 
Now this next reaction is kind of a funky one. Um, it's going through an intermediate called a conotate, which would have uh, a double bond in it. Um, and you know, in making the citrate or isocitrate, you're just sort of adding and subtracting a water molecule depending on which way you do it. You would think, given that the citrate is symmetrical, you would be able to have an equal mixture of the outcome. But in fact, you don't. If you use citrate that's labeled at just one end or something, um, you can show that there's a, a one way that it's used and that this ultimately was explained uh, by understanding more about how enzymes work. And the reason they've drawn these, uh, this OH and this, B, this H in red is to emphasize that it doesn't just happen all over. It happens on a particular part of the molecule. OK, so now we have an isocitrate. And it's iso with the alcohol down there. Um, an isocitrate dehydrogenase, like so many dehydrogenases, is going to produce a reduced cofactor, in this case, NADH. And the carboxylic acid that's hanging off the side of the isocitrate is the, seat, is, the, is the group that's going to be lost as carbon dioxide. So by the rearrangements on the surface of the um, uh, uh, enzyme, you're going to go from having an alcohol at that al alpha carbon to an oxidized carbonyl or an uh, alpha ke uh, keto group there. So this is the carbon that got oxidized. There's the carbon dioxide that got lost. And the electrons are now sitting on the NADH. The loss of the carbon dioxide makes this essentially an irreversible reaction. Was there a question? Sorry, question? OK. Uh, the next step is also a dehydrogenase. So alpha keto glutarate, this is the alpha keto part, the carbonyl there. And glutarate is the dicarboxylic acid, the five carbon dicarboxylic acid. It's again going to reduce another NADH. Um, but in this case, it's also going to consume a, a CoA molecule, and the product of it will be succinyl-CoA. Um, so we have here uh, a bond with some potential to it, so to speak. Now, that should look kind of familiar to you. We just talked about that maybe 15 minutes ago. We're putting in an a alpha-keto uh, carboxylic acid, and we're putting in CoA and NAD+, and we're losing carbon dioxide, and we're getting at NADH and uh, acyl-CoA. That sounds a great deal like pyruvate dehydrogenase. So this, this reaction looks extremely similar to what had to go on in pyruvate dehydrogenase with just the difference of what the substrate is and the size of the product. Um, so one way of remembering all the stuff that goes into this reaction is remembering how much it resembles pyruvate dehydrogenase. This is, again, an irreversible reaction with the carbon dioxide lost. Now, you might think, OK, so far we've lost two carbon dioxides, right? And we put it in acetyl-CoA. Uh, you might think we have burnt off our acetyl-CoA, but not really. Um, if we mark for the moment the carbons with different colors, and let me just see how well that works on your hand. Uh, can you see? Yep. Yeah, you can see it. Good. Um, so if you mark the four carbons of oxide <coughs> excuse me, as gray, and the two from acetyl-CoA as red, um, you can see the citrate molecule like this. <coughs> and as I said, uh, it looks like it's symmetrical, and it ought to be scrambled. But in fact, it's not. And we'll see why in a little bit. But the acetyl-CoA, in fact, goes on the back end of the citrate. It's the old carbons that came in from oxaloacetate that come off at the next two steps. At isocitrate dehydrogenase, we lose one of the atoms from oxaloacetate. From alpha-ketoglutarate dehydrogenase, we lose a carbon from uh, from oxaloacetate. So that succinyl-CoA is a molecule that is half the new carbons that came in with the new acetyl-CoA and half old atoms um, from the oxaloacetate that was at citrate synthase. We're going to see there are rearrangements in here that mean that these, these carbons do eventually get scrambled in, and they do eventually get lost. But the, in the first pass, the carbons that go in are not the carbons that come out. Okay. 
So the next reaction in the series is called succinyl-CoA synthetase. Um, and that should string a bell that this is named backwards, right? In other words, we have a succinyl-CoA molecule, and we're going to end up with succinate. So this is actually named for its backwards reaction. Uh, but that, that CoA compound has the energy equivalent of a high-energy phosphate bond. And so we're going to uh, catalyze overall this reaction, succinyl-CoA plus GDP, GDP, so it's not ADP, it's GDP, uh, are going to produce succinate and GTP and a plain old CoA molecule. Uh, so we're producing a high energy triphosphate in this reaction. This is our second example of substrate level phosphorylation, no, third example of substrate level phosphorylation. We saw two cases of that in the glycol glycolytic pathway. Here's a third one where a, a, just, a sub, just a substrate, an intermediate, has the energy needed to make a new high energy triphosphate bond. <coughs> and because the energies of an ATP and the energies of a CoA are fairly equivalent, this reaction is actually reversible. Um, it's going to take advantage of the fact that um, it can create uh, uh, um, an acyl phosphate. So the succinyl CoA is going to create an acyl phosphate. Here's a succinyl phosphate uh, hanging off of the carbonyl carbon. Uh, that released the CoA compound. And the, um, uh, in order to capture that phosphate energy into an ATP, we're going to park it for a little while on a histidine residue. So here's the histidine. Um, succinyl phosphate's coming in. It's going to transfer its phosphate to the histidine. So here's a phosphohistidine that releases the succinate. The phosphohistidine has preserved the high energy character of that bond. And a GDP can come in at the, that point and receive that phosphate, and it's still a high energy phosphate. Uh, so histidine is a very flexible little side chain. It gets used for acid base catalysis. It gets used for covalent catalysis. You can park a spark. You can park phosphates on it. Very clever little side chain. Um, so. <clears throat> So the next three reactions are going to get us back to oxaloacetate. Um, and uh, as I said, the, these three reactions are ones that we're going to see resemblances in several pathways in the future. So although they're not quite as exotic as some of the earlier ones on the citric acid cycle, they still repay uh, attention. So here we have the succinate molecule. It's a symmetrical dicarboxylic acid. It's got four carbons, right? So fully saturated in there. Um, and the enzyme succinate dehydrogenase, it's a dehydrogenase, so we have a reduced cofactor at the end of it. Um, and interestingly, this dehydrogenase is embedded in the membrane of the mitochondrion. This is the only citric acid cycle enzyme of, of the citric acid cycle that's embedded in the membrane. It's a membrane enzyme. It's an integral membrane protein. Um, and it's going to transfer the electrons from that saturated bond there to FADH2. FAD is not a f generally a freely floating cofactor. It's usually parked on something. And the product of this reaction is fumarate, which has a double bond in the middle now, a nice trans configuration. Uh, the enzyme is named for the direction it goes in the citric acid cycle, succinate dehydrogenase. But this is a pretty reversible reaction. Um, Succinate dehydrogenase can then transfer those electrons to Q, or uh, ubiquinone. And ubiquinone, as reduced ubiquinone, is going to be moving in the plane of the membrane uh, as part of electron transport for oxidative phosphorylation. Any questions about that so far? So we desaturated this bond and put the electrons into something that can be fed into the uh, oxidative phosphorylation. So here's our fumarate, the, the dicarboxylic acid with a double bond in the middle. We can add a water molecule across it and end up with an alcohol where we had a double bond there. Uh, so you can see we've added the water molecule across. This is a, a reversible one again. Uh, and the product of that is malate, a dicarboxylic acid with an alcohol. Uh, malate is also called malic acid, and it's abundant in apples. Malic acid is one of the things that gives tart apples their tartness. Just as citrate, it comes from citric acid, which comes from lemons. So a number of these compounds got named for where they came from the first time. <coughs> 
So here's our malate, dicarboxylic acid with an alcohol there. And we're going to have a malate dehydrogenase, dehydrogenase. Somebody got reduced. Those electrons in the hydrogen got put on NAD, so we have another molecule of NADH. Um, and now we have an alpha keto carbon uh, on, on the oxaloacetate. So we've completely regenerated the, the molecule that we needed for the citrate synthase. We're ready to go the next time someone feeds us an acetyl-CoA. <clears throat> the uh, standard free energy for this compound, or this reaction, is a plus 30 kilojoules. <laughs> I've told you before that, you know, the, the standard free energy change and the actual free energy change can be very different. This is very different. You would think our mitochondria couldn't get anything done. But, in fact, um, the circumstances in the mitochondrion are such that the delta G, the actual one, is sufficiently low that it can get pulled forward uh, by the citrate synthase. So how much energy do we get out of glucose, and where do, where do we get that energy? This is a sort of a summary of where we get it and why the citric acid cycle is such a powerful way of doing it. If we started off back with our glucose, our six carbons there, um, going from the glucose to two molecules of pyruvate, we generated two molecules of NADH. And if we're going to do this aerobically, when we have enough oxygen in our blood supply for the muscles to keep up, each of those NADs can make ultimately three ATP, so that would be six ATP from that. And we made actual ATP in glycolysis. Uh, one glucose gave us two ATP, three if we did it from glycogen. So we have these two three-carbon fragments. We saw how pyruvate dehydrogenase each made a NADH from the, from, from the pyruvate as it was being oxidized, losing that carbon dioxide. So each of them produces... Each pyruvate produces NADH. That's two NADH there, or six ATP. And that gave us two acetyl-CoA. So up to here, up, up to the citric acid cycle, we've got 12, we've got 14 ATP molecules from our glucose. But once we feed those acetyl-CoAs into the citric acid cycle, this is like a little turbine almost, churning its way through oxidizing those carbons. And um, it's going to produce six NADH, three for each, pyruvate, the acetyl-CoA that's fed in. It's going to produce two reduced ubiquinones. Um, so that's 18 ATP from the NADHs. It's four ATP from the ubiquinones. Ubiquinone comes in a little bit further down and only produces two ATP. Um, and even some GTP that we made at the succinate, uh, succinyl-CoA synthetase. Um, so uh, altogether, if you're, you're burning it aerobically uh, from glucose, you can get on the order of 38 um, ATP from a glucose. Um, and this central cycle is uh, a catalytic cycle in that it can be, if you add a small amount of intermediate to it, you can get substantially more activity out of it. So it's a very efficient way to burn, to oxidize uh, the carbons of glucose or to oxidize the carbons of anything that's fed into this cycle. Um, a cycle that's as important as this is a regulated cycle, not too surprisingly. Um, and you, you're probably beginning to think uh, met with metabolic logic already, and the regulation is at the irreversible steps. Um, it doesn't make a lot of sense to try to regulate reversible steps. So the three that we're going to be looking at would be citrate synthase, um, isocitrate dehydrogenase, and alpha-ketoglutarate dehydrogenase. Um, one thing that I think sort of jumps out at you from this, this graph is uh, there's a lot of negative feedback inhibition, right? Uh, so you've got NADH, which is a product of the whole cycle. So NADH is made at several points in the cycle. And NADH is a negative regulator at all three of those irreversible steps. It inhibits the citrate synthase, the isocitrate dehydrogenase, alpha-ketoglutarate dehydrogenase. Um, but there's additional feedback inhibition. Uh, Succinyl-CoA is sort of the end of that um, uh, decarboxylating stage in the uh, cycle. And it feeds back on itself, and it feeds back clear to citrate synthase as a negative regulator. If you're accumulating it, you don't need to make more of it. Um, and citrate feeds back on itself uh, to inhibit uh, citrate synthase. So you've got, you know, you've got product inhibition, 
at uh, citrate synthase and at alpha-ketoglutarate dehydrogenase. There are a couple of places with positive regulation. I mean, you don't want to just turn it off. Um, ADP will stimulate isocitrate dehydrogenase, and ADP is generally a marker for low energy status. You need more of something going, right? Um, and then calcium uh, is a regulator of this pathway acting at both of these dehydrogenases, isocitrate and alpha-keto, glutarate dehydrogenase. Calcium's kind of a funny molecule. Uh, it's not very common in prokaryotes. It's something that we use right to regulate things, but not, not, not uh, uh, prokaryotes. And if it's starting to leak into the mitochondrion, it might be a sign that the mitochondrion is getting de-energized and you need to pump things up a bit more. <clears throat> now, the, the citric acid cycle is one of these things that has sometimes been pointed to as sort of how amazing things are. You could never get part of that to be any use, you know? Um, and so if you try to think of how the citric acid cycle evolved, <clears throat> you could ask yourself, how could anything less than the entire citric acid cycle be any use? And what's interesting is, in fact, we have some very good insight into how you could have less than a cycle and still have each part of it be uh, advantageous. And I once saw an undergraduate solve this in his head from first principles, and I, I've been stunned by that for 20 years. Uh, it was amazing. So if we look at this as, uh, a, partial, as a partial pathway, uh, before you have the whole thing going, what good would it be? Let's take a look at it. Let's start, from, start as if we were doing the usual thing. Here's oxyacetate and acetyl-CoA, so we make some citrate. Um, and we can make, use it oxidatively, the way we did in our cells, down to alpha-ketoglutarate. Well, alpha-ketoglutarate, we're going to see, is a precursor for amino acids. So this limb of it, this branch of it, as an oxidative branch, is a good way to make some intermediates. But you remember how horrendous the uh, delta G was for this reaction. It really looks like it wanted to go back the other way. And in fact, in many organisms, many anaerobic organisms, it does go the other way. And so in anaerobic organisms, you can have reaction going from oxyacetate to malate, from malate to fumarate, and from fumarate to succinate, uh, where you use reducing power from other sources to reduce these compounds and get them into uh, shape to use to make other compounds. Um, succinate is, and uh, succinyl-CoA, for instance, is going to be used as a um, um, precursor for heme. Um, so really, uh, each, every bit of the cycle is useful in its own right. It, it, you're just missing this step in here, and you, you might think, well, how could you ever make that branched synthetic pathway into this beautiful closed cycle? Isn't that pretty improbable? Well, remember that alpha-ketoglutarate dehydrogenase looks an awful lot like pyruvate dehydrogenase. It has the same cofactors. It has the same general architecture of the enzymes. There's enzyme homologies. I mean, sequence homologies, structural homologies. And so the only change that's needed to, to complete this into a cycle is for there to be a mutation in the pyruvate dehydrogenase that can accommodate the alpha-ketoglutarate instead of the pyruvate. So that suggests one of the possible paths uh, by which a complete citric acid cycle might have evolved from these partial um, synthetic pathways. Um, when people were first studying uh, the citric acid cycle, they thought of it as being used to um, uh, be a pathway to reduce intermediates. And so they were pro proposing things like adding a carbon dioxide to alpha-ketoglutarate or to isocitrate. Um, and one of the difficulties with this pathway, of course, is that this reaction here won't go in the direction that would yield acetyl-CoA out of the pathway. You, you, you can't get it out of it that way. So although the bits and pieces were all individually plausible, the relationship between them was not plausible. Now, I said when we started talking about the citric acid cycle that it's an amphibolic pathway. And... Uh, we've talked about it so far catabolically, principally, uh, in terms of oxidizing carbons, producing NADH or FADH2, little GTP. Uh, but it also is a wonderful source of intermediates for other things. Um, in fact, six of the eight intermediates can be used as precursors to make other stuff. I mentioned briefly that succinyl-CoA is one of the key f inputs for heme synthesis. Uh, heme we've seen so far just in hemoglobin and myoglobin. Uh, 
but heme is going to turn out to be incredibly important in many different oxidation reduction enzymes, certainly in uh, the electron transport chain. Uh, so heme is essential to life, I think. I'd have to think about that. There might be some anaerobic organisms about it, but don't, don't worry about that. Alpha ketoglutarate is another sort of powerhouse of a compound. It's a five carbon sugar, alpha keto acid. Um, it will readily make glutamate, and I promised you I'd show you this, and here we can. So alpha ketoglutarate and glutamate are very closely related. Uh, so here you have alpha keto, there's the alpha keto group, um, can be made into glutamate through an enzyme called glutamate dehydrogenase. So this is clearly being named for the direction from glutamate to alpha ketoglutarate. Uh, but this is a um, uh, fairly re reversible reaction. So you can have, uh, you, if you start from alpha ketoglutarate from the citric acid cycle and you've got some ammonia available to you, um, you can use NADH, perhaps produced by the, the cycle or not, um, and use that to reduce this carbon. You notice now it has one bond to a hydrogen, whereas here it had both bonds to an oxygen. So you're reducing that carbon. You now have an oxidized NAD+, and you now have an amino acid. So this is one way to make an amino acid. Um, it costs you an NADH, but it fixes some nitrogen that was previously in inorganic nitrogen. Once you've got glutamate, um, you can use glutamate in making a number of other amino acids, such as arginine or proline. And we'll see those when we get to the nitrogen uh, metabolism part. But glutamine is also important because glutamine is part of all the bases for nucleotides. So bits and pieces of glutamine end up in, in adenosine and, and thymine and guanosine and, and cytosine. All of them have part, at least, of a, of a glutamate molecule. So alpha ketoglutarate, the citric acid cycle intermediate, doesn't have to go very far to end up in nucleic acids. <clears throat> this is um, sort of another summary of uh, some of the places that things go. Uh, we've mentioned already the alpha ketoglutarate going to amino acids and nucleotides. Uh, we mentioned succinyl-CoA going off to heme. Uh, malate, we're going to see, can be used to make pyruvate. Um, and pyruvate uh, can be used for a variety of things. Uh, oxalacetate can be used for glucose. If you remember back to gluconeogenesis, uh, if you started from pyruvate, you had to make oxalacetate before you could make phosphenylpyruvate. Um, but you can also just withdraw the oxalacetate from the citric acid cycle and use it for gluconeogenesis directly. So you could, in principle, for example, feed in a, a, a glutamate amino acid here as alpha ketoglutarate, use several reactions of the cycle, and then take the carbon backbone out here to use it to make glucose. We're also going to see how the citrate uh, molecule can be used to make fatty acids and cholesterol. Uh, so if you're feeding in compounds elsewhere and you withdraw the citrate for those, you can use them synthetically for that. So if you look at this, you can see the citric acid cycle provides precursors for amino acids, for nucleic acids, for carbohydrates, and for lipids. Uh, it really is there at the center of, of almost everything. Okay. There's a little bit of a challenge involved in the citric acid cycle um, in that uh, if you think about pyruvate, we make most of our pyruvate um, in the cytoplasm out of glucose, for example. Uh, but we need to be able to get the pyruvate into the mitochondrion. On the other hand, if we want to use um, some of those carbon backbones for synthesis uh, in the cytoplasm, we may have to get stuff out of the mitochondrion. And so to get back and forth between them, the inner mitochondrial membrane has some specialized kind of transport uh, carriers. And then the cytoplasm and the matrix of the mitochondrion have a variety of enzymes that allow them to tweak stuff. Um, and so if you're, be patient with me here for a little bit. Um, if we bring our pyruvate, if, okay, let's see. Let's think of this for a moment in, as if what we're trying to do is to get some carbon backbones out for lipid synthesis, for example. So let's start from the citrate. I mentioned that that can be used to do lipid synthesis. 
Lipid synthesis happens in the cytoplasm, not in the mitochondria. Well, there is a shuttle that will allow citrate to pass in or out of the, of the, of the mitochondria. And in the cytoplasm, an enzyme called ATP citrate lyase <coughs> can recover an acetyl-CoA um, and yield an, an oxaloacetate. That acetyl-CoA then can be used for the uh, lipid biosynthesis. Oxaloacetate uh, can then be um, uh, oxidized to malate. And a special enzyme in the cytoplasm called malic enzyme can take malate to pyruvate at the cost of a carbon dioxide. So, uh, so far what we've done is we moved out six carbons. We put two of them in a form that can be used for lipid synthesis. We threw one carbon away, and we're sending this three-carbon piece back into the mitochondrial matrix. Um, we put back on a carbon dioxide through pyruvate carboxylase. We've seen that enzyme before. Um, and now we're back to oxaloacetate. Um, so this is um, a way to move things. It costs a little bit of energy to do it, uh, but it's a way of moving things across the mitochondrial membrane um, without just making the whole membrane permeable to everything. Uh, Malic enzyme is a little interesting because it uses NADP plus rather than NAD plus. Uh, so taking malate to pyruvate uh, reduces an NADP. And maybe given the hour and everything, we'll call that a place to break. See you all Monday. <laughs>